morning, Martin. Thanks for being here. Good morning. So uh, good to meet you finally after uh, a few of these email conversations. So are you ready to change the world? I'm ready to give a, a, a sincere and enthusiastic try. A hard try, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is good. So um, where do we start? Um, do you have any any uh, things you want to start with, or should we just uh, dive in? Dive in. Okay. So, um, where do we want to start? So, um, I think a lot of, um, so you've seen, I mean, I think you're quite familiar with, you, you did some background reading on OSC, like there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff you, you definitely did look at. Well, I like, uh, you are interested in a lot of, because this is not just about uh, talking about building machines. This is a much greater thing. It's about creating a new paradigm for civilization. So that includes many other levels. I'm glad you're, you're appreciating some of the other writing, like on all the philosophical aspects about uh, distribution of power, true empowerment of people. What does it really mean? How do we grow as humans so that everybody can benefit? And and I think the, uh, as you can pr probably see, the unique value proposition is is about, uh, you know, this thing that's clarified for me over the last year. It's it's like about getting specific on what does it mean to create a collaborative economy? Or like right now we say collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. That's that's the way we position that. And there's a very concrete pathway we can take to that. So that's definitely like, a, if you talk about, I mean, it is a big goal in terms of, you, you've got this economy that happens today. It's proprietary, it's based on, you know, it's, there's a lot of suffering happening. And then we're saying, hey, how do we do better? Why, how do we create a change in this operating system that is definitely tangible and possible, but you know, there's a lot of blocks to it. And it starts with the responsibility of each and every one of us. So our change model is how do we, uh, I mean, start by distributing power, distributing the economy. You know, that's, that's where we start. Uh, make, make empowerment available to anyone. Forget about castes or <laughs> castes or underprivileged people. Like who, um, let's, let's bring the play, playing field up for everybody. Let's, um, let's start talking about mutually assured abundance here, not I read that, uh, the other way around. I, yeah. I read that prior to World War II, uh, all of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the world lived in self-sufficient villages and all the machinery that was created in World War II was used to create, create you know, the centralized, you know, decentralized, how do I put it? Uh, you know, all the developments in World War II were used to actually create a consumer economy or, you know, take away from uh, the self-sufficient villages. So people who have not seen history have not read it. They will not know the past or what the world was 50 years back. Yeah, and I wouldn't say it's ex exactly like definitely World War II made it happen a lot. Like the whole industrialization now, you didn't have any more bombs to make. What do you do with your industrial system? You know, that that's the problem the U.S. ran into. But I think the pattern is longer. I mean, it's it's... I mean, I think there's a continuation of history where that's been going on from the Roman Empire. You've got industrialization, the Industrial Revolution. So this is much older, but but I think it gets more intense, like definitely got really intense after this, the Second World War. A lot of this stuff happened. I think a lot of things accelerated. Now I think things are accelerating even more with technology. You know, you can have division towards good or bad. Uh, but the, the options are there for good or bad, and that's 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 why we have to get involved in uh, trying to course trying to course out a, a good course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. So as far as uh, what we do, I mean, right now, just to kind of like, uh, you know, we've been at it for some time here, just doing a lot of different proofs of concept and prototypes, and doing a lot of a uh, lot of builds, but thing is right now it's really about like developing the enterprise aspect so the, the immersion program that the mentorship is so people can do this because one thing I notice is that it takes a lot of effort and time for people to to learn this like for me I live it and I thought that this would be much farther along than it is right now as people take it up but it's 
there are a lot of blocks, a lot of blocks to that because people just are completely sucked up into another economy and they've got to pay their bills and they don't have the time to to do this. So it's it has to be a very savvy entrepreneurial approach. Uh, right now we're we're talking about enterprise development much more in the sense that we've developed all these different things that we thought were going to explode. They didn't really. So what does it really mean to, to make an effective enterprise model and make it replicate? So that's that's the question which which we're working on right now. So the 3D printer, tractor, housing, the housing project is a big one uh, right now. Um, and we kind of mid-corrected more towards the housing. We were doing a lot of the steam camps and, and the 3D printer work right before COVID hit. But when we had to cancel all that, I mean, we couldn't do the in-person builds we asked, well, what's really important? And it seems that the one problem that we're trying to solve for is people showing up to, to have a continuous development cycle where people don't disappear but continue with it for a long time. And we thought the house was a great need and a great project to rally around because we're not going to have pe uh, trouble getting people to show up. So that's kind of how we went at it. Now the 3D printer is still part of the enterprise development as far as we do want to do a lot of uh, construction material printing with larger printers and the ability to recycle uh, plastic from trash. So you might have heard heard about that, but that's definitely a lot of potential on uh, 3D printing there. Uh, but I think the 3D printer is much more tangible, uh, I mean, easier than the housing project, like for housing, like, you know, if you're talking about your fit, like what, what can you do? I think the, the 3D printing is is a definitely a good good way to start so I, I would really encourage that we are going to have the on-site training where we're going to do both the construction the machines like tractor building and 3d printer like towards the shredder and the plastic recycling this september so september october november we're going to have our uh, on-site training and a lot of that will be for for the house construction but also around the 3d printer plus tractor because they're supporting technologies you need those to also to help you build. Yeah. Okay. There was one point I didn't get. I mean, you said it was some, uh, somewhere in, uh, a few, a couple of minutes back, you said it would become, uh, we expected to explode into something and that didn't happen due to COVID or something. Can you please repeat that point? Oh, I'm talking even further. Like, for example, in tw 2008, when I first published the Brick Press, I thought, oh yeah, people are going to take it. It's going to get replicated all over the world because it was cheaper, faster, better than anything else out there. And nobody really wanted to do it. And it's like, what's going on here? Uh, that, that was a, you know, it was a surprise. Because I thought, okay, you know, we spent, you know, at that time, like a year, two or two or three years, uh, or at least a couple of years, you know, developing the machine. It worked better than we thought. And we thought, it's like, wow, uh, can I actually publish this? Because that means people are going to make millions and stuff like that. I want to maybe keep, even keep it to myself. And I said, no, 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 this is about spreading it, first of all. It was like one of those truth moments where I think I have a great product. And it was like my truth moment for saying, OK, do I share it with the world or do I proprietize it? And of course, the answer to me was clear because it's about making a difference and changing the world. So that uh, so practicing the open development. But Contrary to what I thought, I, I thought that people will be able to take this and start businesses all over the world. None of it happened. Right now, there's not a single person producing the brick press outside of ourselves, you know? I can gladly so, set up that as well. I can gladly do that as well in addition to the, you know, the 3D printing and everything. Yeah. You know, you know, housing is a big dream for everybody here. Housing is a very big dream here. It's a lifetime dream for people in India. And most people, they rent, uh, live in rented houses and they take big loans and, you know, yeah. they pay a loan for a lifetime, oh, yeah. 25 years, 30 years here. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think, you don't have a light frame construction in India, do you? Meaning like wood, uh, stick, stick frame, wood frame? Uh, no, no. What we have is brick and mortar construction. Then what is coming is prefabricated or precast construction. And recently I saw somebody borrowing an Australian technology called V-Boards, fiber, uh, cement, is that fiber cement? Yeah, I think that's fiber, fiber cement, cement boards, V boards. Yeah. Yeah. So other than that, and uh, the way it works is here. Uh, basically, when you hire a contractor, people who got money or people are working, they take a loan. They are mostly into flats and big cities. Nobody gets land to actually because a lot of the cases in the Supreme Court are around land dispute. Buying the land is a very big challenge here. Buying land is very big challenge. You never know who the owner is. And in big cities, it is very expensive. Even my brother, he he's bought a flat in Bangalore. 
So if you go to tier two cities, you can buy land. And once you buy that, you hire a contractor. Typically, you go through some uncle or some relative who knows somebody and you trust him blindly. And uh, you just pay him what he asks, you take a loan or if your resources you spend on them. And usually they end up fleecing because it's okay for businessmen to flee. That's how business works here. I mean, that is a culture. Yeah. That is the understanding. No, that's fascinating, you know, like with the recent uh, disruptions in this country, we thought we were turning into a banana republic, but it's like, man, we should be glad. I'm glad, I guess I'm glad I'm not in India because the corruption seems to be way out of control, you know. It's beyond corruption, it is thugs. I, I don't know what the word gundaism means in English. Uh, uh, maybe I should not talk it here. It's that thugs are, when people use muscle power, right? I, I don't know what the word for that in English is. In uh, Hindi, it's called gundaism, or, you know, thugs or what do you call it? Thugs. <laughs> yeah. If that's what you play, yeah. It's, yeah. The, uh, the system is controlled by them. Yeah. It's like yeah. that, what I said. On so, yeah. Well, so, so con to continue the theme on on enterprise that my mindset right now is it's like okay we've got decades decade or two of experience and this stuff is you know theoretically it works it looks great on paper we've got a lot of good prototypes a lot of proofs of concepts on everything and it's like it's time to get get people on road but one th but one thing you notice is that there's no magic to development like it takes a lot of resource like I would actually estimate like a million bucks per project to get it to a viable business. It's the same thing that happens with VC. It's like you get a million, you start it up, you then make some business, proof of concept, minimum viable product, and then you start, you know, sales and stuff. But the amount of effort is significant and we need bodies, we need people who are committed. So we're doing a different approaches. Like one is, I mean, definitely the enterprise development with a CD go home but with a mentorship thing it's like what i would envision seeing is that each one of us has a micro factory that's operating in their community with collaboratively developed design but the problem with that is it needs the bodies the collaborative part that part is what i don't think open source uh, hardware that's never solved it i don't think we ever solved like how do you get people to show up so that's the problem we are still solving for and i think we are going to solve for that with the housing and that that way we can bootstrap uh, the further development but i think the, the people like yourself uh, people who want to uh, be the i mean you're definitely early adopter you know um we need it's it only takes so much effort to do it it's like if i were to say okay if you wanted to transform the world through a dedicated effort like a billion bucks and like the world would be like stand up upside down on its I mean, there's a finite amount of effort that's required before a product is simply better, like Linux has shown. Yeah. But once you get it, something. the thing just go goes. And that's the thing. But that's the thing. Like, we are not in a culture of that collaborative literacy where people can get it. So it's it's been hard. That's, that's the challenge. And part of it is why I'm saying, okay, people, let's do this together. Let's believe in this way that we can all... Like whatever we do, we're completely transparent and open, and that grows onto itself. And I mean, that's always been the vision. But then, uh, how do you actually then start implementing it in practice? So the mentorship is part of part of that game, where it's like, are there even people that want to do it? And it's like, yeah, of course. I mean, there's. Uh, I believe people would love to learn the things that I have learned in practice. Uh, just really immersive. There's there's the practical part, and then there's the theoretical part. I mean, it's it's all working. I think that's a priceless package. Like it's something that I wish I ha I had if I went to college. You know. Yes, obviously. Yes. But <laughs> building your own <laughs> local economy, correct? Yeah. Imagine if you look at uh, countries like Africa or poor Asian countries, for example, right, where uh, they have to depend on grants from big countries like the U.S. or World Bank or you know International Monetary Fund. But uh, these people are able to create their own local economy using a CD or a DVD, as you say, right? Well, they even depend on funds from the local government or state government, for example. They would have built their own economies. That, that's a fantastic idea to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the idea is somewhat obvious, but it's like to get true buy-in from people is, is rather difficult. So that's that's been the challenge. Because it's just, uh, I mean, it's so obvious, but it's too obvious and too simple. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, like, it the, the bottom line is it requires some focus and dedication of people to do it. Like, for example, for the 3D printer enterprise, Okay, what are all the assets we need? We need marketing assets. We need absolute digitized product asset, like complete. Um, every single element is high quality, complete, digitized. Kind of like, I don't know if you ever heard of Peter Diamandis talk about digitize. 
uh, the five D's of disruption. I'll check the problem, Google. Yeah, but it starts with digital. Like once something becomes digital, it becomes replicable. So from digital to democratize, demonetize, disrupt, and all that. Uh, there's, there's a whole chain of once something is digital, which this stuff is. So uh, yeah. now we can collaborate globally and we can make it happen. But it needs just the due diligence. We need to develop all the assets. Sorry, that word again. It needs. I missed that word. I'm sorry. I missed your word. It needs. Uh, sorry, say that again. Uh, I missed your word. I'm sorry. Apologies to interrupt you, but I missed your word. You said something after the five Ds. You were on the Five Ds of disruption. So if I Google yeah, that, yeah. it's. I'll do that afterwards. Yeah. Oh, please go on, brother. Please go on. I'll go there. Yeah. Please go on. Yeah, the idea. I'll go, I'll go that. Yeah, the idea is that. Uh, I mean, the concept is simple. It's like once it's digital, you can get a lot of people collaborating, and with enough people collaborating, you make a better product. But you have to go through all the due diligence of a normal business. It's, you can't cut any corners. Like you gotta, like at first it was like, well, you gotta make money too. Like I definitely accept right now that um, revenue models are critical. It's something that I thought would be like ancillary, but I think in today's economy, revenue models are like right now. I ask. Well, do you have a revenue model? What's your revenue model? If I talk about to, to a potential collaborator, like that's the first thing to develop because we can have nice ideas, but how do we actually gain traction? But a revenue model means that you're meeting a service, meeting a need, giving product products to people that are meeting a significant need. And that's like the core, which I guess I didn't pay any attention to it. So if, if there's anything I would have done differently, I would have paid attention maybe to um, productize one thing like early on so that could provide the financial feedback loops for further growth right but you know but then again when i think about all the stuff that we have done it's like well you know so we got so much prototype and so much like inspiration and integration from that work that i think that more integrated perspective about whole product ecologies and the modular design how things fit together uh, there's a lot of learning there of trying to do a solid foundation, like a deceptive foundation that before it goes into the disruptive exponential growth phase, there's a lot of groundwork to be done. And I think we've yeah. done that. That's that's where I think right now we're we're ready to take off. So that that's where we're at. Perfect. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. And ideas there. So so it's like collaborating so you myself the other people there's a there's a guy who's uh, in Indonesia right now there's a South African guy that, um, who's working on a 3d printer one guy in America and it's like okay let's develop an open enterprise I mean I, we're selling the printers right now for example um, but we haven't done much marketing or business development around it so you need to productize it package it nicely do a good website and all that and that's the thing that what I like to do is OSC is is the hub of R and D, the product development, where all of us collaborate on the assets, and then anyone can draw from because the markets are huge. Like, we first of all start with anything that's more than a billion dollar market, so there's plenty of it to go around towards the uh, what you might have heard me say as distributed market substitution. Any common product can be turned from one corporation making it to thousands and tens of thousands of independent collaborating economic agents doing it so that's that's what we're after nobody's done it in a world right and that's that's a that's a game changer and that's I've never heard of anything like poetry never heard of anything like poetry on the world i keep googling a lot yeah last 10 15 years never heard of anything like poetry yeah. yeah no it's true it's like it's it's you know it's it's pretty amazing to me like i feel i mean i'm so excited about all this work but to me it's just amazing that uh somebody is not beating us to that kind of a notion you know i showed my friends actually the osc website and the list of the 50 products and their various the burned out charts and their various development phases some of them got outright scared when they saw the website they can't believe that something like this somebody's doing that <laughs> yes they can't believe that they got scared <laughs> yeah i put a question on facebook open question that somebody ought to join it not a single reply yeah. people are scared to even think of that scale of challenge you know yeah it's yeah yeah and that's what we're saying exactly hey we're going to take a problem one after another we're going to solve it 
one right after, yeah. right after another. And like, that's what I wish my PhD or school was there for. Your, your fusion and, energy PhD. Well, but let me tell you another thing. Like, so I went to Princeton, right? And um, I thought I'd meet all these idealistic people who are all into changing the world. And instead, I, it's like I found a breeding, I, I like to say the breeding ground for the power structure of the world. I mean, not okay. the kind of not the kind of people I was expecting, but that's the reality. You know? So it's not you don't point is there is not a place where you can go to right now. There's a lot of different efforts which work on good things. There's a lot of commendable work, but I think we got to get very focused on saying, okay, here's some issues. We train you explicit like the the OSC campus. We train you explicitly to understand how the world works and to tackle the biggest issues on the planet. The closest that anybody else says about it, it's like Peter Diamandis. He does say that about global grand challenges and solving them. But um, yeah, I think for us, it's about creating a uh, university-like campus where it does that and creates the whole field, uh, whole uh, infrastructure where that that's what you're committing your life to. So s people who have a serious commitment and dedication to changing the world towards an ethocracy, like ethical people, the ethical economy. So simple, simple idea. I mean, but we got to make it happen. So that's well, that's the idea. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, as far as uh, so as far as the 3D printer. Uh, the idea would be like if you want to do that, then the idea would be to build one ASAP and start sure. contributing assets to it. So there's plenty of stuff to do. Like even uh, from what is the number one need? I would say right now for the 3D printer, uh, the biggest need is perfected documentation, marketing materials, websites. Uh, I think we can do better on like promotional well like the cad is pretty much it's complete but there is no final assembly uh the assembly is like maybe like 90 percent but we're talking about get everything to a hundred percent now what does that mean like you should be able to correlate here's the cad and from the cad you should be able to extract what i call i call this bom quality cad in other words that the cad includes every every single part down to every screw and you can mm -hmm. correlate that to the bill of materials so yeah. you can go completely between CAD bill materials yeah and therefore the CAD instructionals animations anything because it's all in there if the CAD is complete you have access to everything exploded part okay. diagrams uh, the CAD should correspond to uh, every single thing that you see in, the, in that CAD, in FreeCAD, should be a thing that you click on Amazon or your local supplier or whatever. You know, stuff like that. So, uh, perfection towards that sense. And then, um, uh, the next, I mean, so, so we're at the printer where we developed our own extruder. We've got a insulated heated bed. The next two things on it are the high temperature build chamber. Which we don't have. Was that for the was that for the pyro 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 um, I'm not sure exactly which that is, but it's related technology. It's about enclosed heating chambers. Uh, we do make our own oh. heater elements. You might have seen some work about uh, the nichrome heater. The burning tires, I think. Because fuel, I was looking at the ways for burning tires for fuel, you know, because people have extracted petrol from fuel and uh, somebody in Hyderabad, the professor. Yeah, pyrolysis, that's, um, I mean, that's one of the other technologies that are available. You can readily pyrolyze things like biomass or tires and turn it back yeah. into fuels. Yeah. Uh, each of these is a development project, right? We haven't done the pyrolysis experiments here explicitly, but once again, the idea is, okay, we get a few businesses started that bootstrap people up, and then the movement grows. So I'm gonna try to, you know, keep uh, keep you on track to do that to make sure we're focused on getting one product out after another. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I, I'm, I'm like hearing you like, okay, what about this? You, you you sent me an email about some franchise, this or that idea. 
but it's like first of all let's look at only stuff that's open and distributable so it can scale and more people can get involved and the more people there are that's not the disadvantage that's an advantage it's related to the idea of the distributed market substitution where it's really it's um uh, i have a mentor and he he came up with a term called uh, uh he he says it historic transfer of wealth from the few to the many well that's what would happen like right now you can say a lot of people like it with a corporation there's a lot of capital going up so like yeah. i would say probably like on some accounts you can say probably like maybe 80 percent of the real wealth is going you know kind of going up funneling up we've got to reverse that like 20 percent like make 80 percent of the 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 wealth go to the people go to the people that are actually making that wealth instead of marginalizing those upon which that wealth is built so it happened in india march and i mean uh, in the in the last one year where covid happened right and the economy was locked down for 12 months the richest people the top 50 billionaires became rich by 35 percent reliance industry is the owner he's the richest person in india and probably the eighth or the 15th richest in the world his net worth shot up by 35 percent and uh, poor people, you know, marginal people or marginal farmers have been losing livelihoods, suicides also. Yeah. All sorts of things happen. Yeah. That's happening. Um, the yeah. Pareto's principle, the Pareto's principle where, you know, 90% of wealth belongs to 10% of the people, right from uh, the 13th century or so, I think it's been that trend, it's getting worse. Yeah. yeah. That distribution of the world, redistribution has to happen. Right. And I hear you saying some those messages and I hear you saying like, uh, you mentioned the word ethical, like people are not ethical. Uh, so I like it. I, I think uh, I think you you at least say the word. So that's that's awesome as a start because it's really about creating, as I said, the ethical economy. So it, it takes which which also um, like maybe you can explain to me like you're saying. So sometimes I hear you saying, well, I think it's reconcilable. Like, oh yeah, you want to make money, but the money wants to be. It wants to be clean money. <laughs> Let's do that while yeah. <laughs> distributing yeah. the wealth to everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you like to build things. You want to do things with ha your hands. Like, um, do you think you? It seems like you're you've been withdrawn from that for, from over your life. So you're trying to make up for it, but because uh, uh, you, you really emphasize that, like you want to be doing that all day. Like, tell me more about that. Yeah, because uh, I don't know, this is something I discovered recently when I started figuring out how I learn. Uh, it said I'm a guy with a visual memory and kinesthetic learning capabilities. There's a VAR, VARK, visual auditory. Has the video frozen? No. I, oh, you're I, able to see. Okay. Okay. So there is this VARK questionnaire, visual auditory uh, reading and kinesthetic questionnaire. I, for example, I can't read a book even for a page, but if I have to build a Lego, for example, I can send you the video I post on YouTube. I was talking and building, I built a Meccano's junior engine non-stop in two hours. Initially, I thought, why am I doing it on video? It's not going to happen. But then I built it non-stop in two hours. So if I had to do physical work, I had to take my bike apart, I put it back together. And maybe a bit of passion comes to bikes or mechanical things. We had a festival here. It's called Deepa Audi. It's, it's a uh, country-level festival. On that day, I went and had my bike painted in uh, Captain America style. I'll send you pics. I repainted it in Captain America style. You know, the Avengers film. And I had to take my car apart the other day. One thing I see here is you get a lot of physical exercise. You get to sit in the sun. You get to use your hands and legs. I've done a bit of carpentry as well. Bought some tools. You know, when I'm cutting it, every, you know, you're in the zone in the sense your mind and body are in one place. And that, whether the sound or the vibration, you're... You know, when you're using your hands and legs, the entire mind and body are at one place and somehow I feel in, zo in the zone when I'm doing that. Yeah. I, I've been all my life in software, I've been a keyboard warrior with playing with my fingers and uh, maybe a pen and a notebook. But I have seen that that life, you know, half of the life in typical IT companies are lost in meetings and uh, a delegating work. Uh, there's not too much work satisfaction there. You can't see what you have built, you can't see what you executed. Nothing tangible, nothing to feel. You look at construction, for example, you, you bring a team to build something. You can really see the product at the end of the day. You can yeah. show it to people, you feel nice. Just one way of looking at it. But other than that, when I get to do things with physically, the kinesthetic ability is more on me rather than, you know, I'm good at other things as well, like computers, for example, or I'm writing a book on accounting. But again, for people with uh, right brains or right brain people who got a visual memory for them. 
because when you see it is more than a thousand words when you see something a picture is more than a thousand words but books in my opinion have always been a means of communication they're not a means of learning because you really can't learn from a book you only learn when you try the best of learning happens when you discover something and that happens when you ask a question we are in quest of something yeah. most of learning happens from a person not from reading a book so i'm sorry for deviating but essentially building keeps me very happy i think yeah no that's good that's good i think there's definitely there's a fundamental joy to that and it's very very human uh most people just haven't experienced it and i think most people haven't really seen it but i think there's a huge transformation that people can get when they get that kind of experience and that's part of the work we want to do is to show people that they can transform their mindset like how how possible things are and how you can affect things for real and you don't you don't get offended by any problems you're like yeah let's solve problems uh becomes a lot of my friends mindset. for example are in sorry yeah. a lot of my friends for example are in high paying jobs in software or another test jobs I, i don't think how many of, i'm not sure the how you know the real 5% of them are satisfied with their jobs their deadlines and uh, their meetings and you know they're constantly mentally juggling between house issues and uh, health issues finance issues and work issues 95% of them most of my friends and my circle i don't think they're working out of joy they're just doing it for the money it it's not and uh, they've got their career aspirations you know all this concept of career aspiration going to a senior level this more of an or even for that matter it's all an artificial mindset that's built in into them right from schooling or from their surroundings and relatives or friends you know competing with others peer pressure buying a better car buying a better house if they come out of all this mental artificialities is the word like artificiality for example you know i don't think the age of the I, i keep talking to my friends who are at the head of companies here most of them they just do their work and they want to enjoy the weekend nobody's too happy to do their work but there's a kind of work where i enjoy i don't mind sitting all day and actually repairing the car for example or taking a bike apart for example you know i'm sure they would enjoy my own friend he runs a business in uh, a town here he says you know choice how to get into carpentry so that's a hobby on to pick up people I was surprised because he he did the software engineering like me. He spent 15 years in Bepro, leading IT services company here. Post that, he's got two or three factories. His family is entirely into six businesses, six brothers. And he told me, Ashwin, I don't enjoy all of this work, you know, that wherein I delegate work to somebody or run a company. I want to do some carpentry at home in my free time. So people enjoy different things, and what they do, most of them are like. Yeah. Do you think that any of your friends would actually? be susceptible to being transformed like that or they they wouldn't they wouldn't enjoy oh, I see uh, oh, I see I think they find it challenging I showed to a few people they got outright scared when they saw those pictures of machines <laughs> otherwise they uh, got scared you know because it is challenging for them you know uh, most of my uh, friends are from software so basically if, if they're saying something from software somebody's building a tractor somebody I saw the word open source car I said somebody said what the hell they didn't understand open source car for example If a motorcycle can be built, for example, they can't believe it. They think it's a wonder. You know, most of these people are schooled. They're not even educated. They're not taught to think. If they, if they learn a particular kind of work and they repeat that every single day, and on the job they learn in bits and pieces, the ability to think is very, you know, it's a very rare thing. It's mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. very challenging for most people. So even building is difficult for people. If you ask somebody to repair their car, they'll take it to a mechanic. They'll say, "I'm giving up." So so how did you? Uh you know become different or you you developed a different perspective was there anything particular that changed your life or uh, maybe i tend to overthink maybe it's a good thing sometimes <laughs> maybe i tend to overthink maybe it's a good thing sometimes you know for example the uh, the, uh, the pump in my house that actually takes water from the basement all the way to the uh, top i don't know how it works and that doesn't make me comfortable if somebody says while driving the car don't do this do that i want to understand how a car works inside maybe it's some curiosity you know i like to think about things mm-hmm. for example i wrote an article on how banks work they take money with simple interest they give out with amortization you know it is maybe it is some innate curiosity to understand how things work inside mm-hmm. i i i bought this toy for example a small one you push it on the top it moves ahead it's a small child toy i put a question on facebook how does it work can anyone answer people didn't know the answer i took the toy apart i found out that when you push it it compresses the spring and the vertical uh, gear or the threading comes in touch with a gear system and when you push it back it makes two or three gears cogs sorry cogs that are intertwined to make it go ahead 
So you know, it's that curiosity to find out how things work. Yeah. Maybe it is because I have more time than my friends, or maybe I, I'm curious. I don't know. Or yeah. maybe over time. So no, that's that's it. I mean. How things work yeah just people i think uh thinking tires a lot of people out so <laughs> we're not really no i mean but the schools they don't teach you how to think or have that curiosity it's yes. like, that, that's not part of the curriculum really let's talk about um you want to jump right into the 3d printer yeah so on the 3d printer project how much have you looked at look at the d3d 3d printer uh, I, I had a quick look at diagrams. I'm not taking a look at it so far. I apologize for it. Okay. But I read about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on? Okay. So, say, what, what would you see your your timeline or like first order of business and stuff like that? So, first of all, does the 3D printer? I mean, you you're interested in that? Yeah. You know, the, as you said, there's a lot of learning there. So basically, yeah. that at least tell me how good I am for the OSC kind of work. You know? That I'm good enough for you know that's a good starting point. I'll get to learn a lot. Of How much are you familiar with? Uh, I mean, what kind of programming do you do? What I've done Java programming, I've done design in computers, but I can pick up a software tool like CAD, for example, not a problem. I can pick it up. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, because I mean, the, the first thing, I mean, obvious thing is to to build a thing. So, um, yeah. Do you have a budget for prototyping stuff that, because the the materials are three hundred to six hundred dollars, depending depending on how you do it. But for the small printer, the D three D Pro, the basic one that with the eight inch bed, that's the materials are say around five hundred bucks or so. Uh, so if you want to do that, that that would be the thing to do. And then you probably want to like to. How do you know that you understand this thing when you can print the parts? So you build the first one, you print the parts and are able to document and b fully build the next one. And then you can talk about, okay, now I can actually uh, perhaps start producing. Um, do you have uh, do you have any experience with doing video? Uh, I can do that. Uh, I've done a lot of video just for the, you know, I teach, I do presentations, but I can do that. Not a problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Would you ever see yourself? Video essentially no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You mean video in the sense with a tripod, right? I mean, like instructional uh, videos, videos. Like here, oh, can can you, how can you contribute to, for example, instructional videos? So here's the A to Z super complete build. Because we don't really have a video. We don't have a one piece video like that yet. You know, there's various things we need to generate. So I'm, I'm curious. I can do that. No problem. See yourself doing documentation work. How are you, how are you on technical writing? I haven't done this before. Mm -hmm. The video I can show you because I, I had done that, you know, the mechanics video, etc. with example. A non stop two hour video where I put it and I was talking as I was doing it. So I built it when I was talking. It was the first time I was building it. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm good at talking and actually showing things. Mm -hmm. But technical writing, I've done that before. Do you have you taught people? Do you enjoy teaching? Yeah. I learn by teaching. That's one more thing I realize about oh, myself. As I talk, I learn by teaching. It sounds parad it sounds paradox or I don't know what's the word for it. Or it sounds counterintuitive maybe. I learn by teaching. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's good because that's that's kinda how I learn too. I I would say. Uh, if you really want to learn learn something, teach it because you have to ask all the questions of how to do it. Correct. Yeah. Richard Feynman said the same thing as well, I think. Feynman. Feynman said that. The yeah. Scientist. Yep, yep, yep. He said that as well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know someone else who was that, like for example, Amory Lovins from Rocky. You know Amory Lovins from Rocky Mountain Institute. He also says that he's a he's a known guy in the energy field here, like renewable energy. But he says when whenever he teaches, he makes sure that it's something he knows nothing about <laughs> as a start. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you can appreciate it because I really appreciate it. Yeah. That's, that's how we no, I, ha I had that same situation many times when I don't know something and I talk about it, though I make mistakes uh, while doing it. Later, I get knowledge which I wouldn't bring myself by talking, just by talking aloud. Sometimes we maybe get it or stand in two different places, uh, three different places, have a board, and each a different voice from each different place, two or three voices talking loudly in the room mm -hmm. with a whiteboard on. Yeah. That, that has helped me in the past. Yeah. It sounds counterintuitive, but it works even when you don't know and you talk. It brings out everything in your subconscious mind. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an effective way. People are a lot of people are like, "What do you mean you're going to teach if you don't know something?" You know, they think that's crazy, but I think that's a very valid way to do it. 
Do, so the place that you're at is that is that your house? You do you, or is that an apartment? Yes. Or? Uh, this is my house in Hyderabad, the first floor, yeah. And um, do you have space to set up a little workshop? How big space would I need? I've got a house in Mysore as well. Uh, how much would I need? Uh, you need space, like, to to build. Uh, you need as little as, I mean, you need some organizational space, but I'd say, like, like... Um, square foot. Square foot, for example. Square foot, like, in a room. Like, if I were to set up... I would say a minimum production shop where you're it depends uh, because you also need to do some metal cutting that you can really do there but like 400 square feet for a basic space no oh, more than thousand yeah oh, more than thousand combination. yeah do you, do you have any tools that have you done any stuff like abrasive metal cut off or band saw or I'll buy them there's a place near my house which I call it my shop the do whole you, road is full of all sorts of engineering tools do you, have, no. do you, you want to do learning and uh, welding? Gladly. I mean, what are you saying? I'll start off with that. I'm happy to work with any metal, any any kind of tool. Yeah. I yeah, that's what I really I recently wanted to build actually a bicycle which got four wheels. You know, it's called it's a row cycle. And uh, there I started looking up uh, DIY on instructables. They said do brazing and welding for that. Two things that need to be built up. So I put that aside because OSC was to happen, but otherwise the plan was to build a row cycle. Something where you can do rowing and there's a four-wheeled bicycle. That's that's not there at all in India. We have a lot of bicycle enthusiasts here, but nobody's in a row cycle. It's, it's there only in the US. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to learn actually welding and brazing. I think it's called brazing if I'm right. I don't remember the term. But two things you need to pick up to actually, you know, build your own bicycle frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm more than happy to pick up those things. There's a place near my house, an entire street that only sells industrial tools. I joke that it's a toy shop, the whole road is a toy shop because you get all sorts of toys. There. Yeah, they have welders and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. 400 square feet, gladly. I, I have at least 1,000. And uh, once I go to Mysore, I plan to buy some land, one acre, which will be 40,000 square foot. So I'll have an entire uh, farm like a thing as a shed. Not a problem. That's good. Not a problem at all. Um, let's see. When did you, so do you still work for your, the company you worked for or? No, I started working in 2016 and 2016, 2019 I didn't work. Then in 2019 I thought I'll start a business. Then I started, initially I had no clue because nobody helps and there are no courses. Then I started collecting ideas and uh, what the ideas that I sent you by email, every one of them I thought would uh, build a startup idea. But my heart was more into building things or starting an industry. I didn't want to get into, you know, this kind of, you know, either the, uh, the there's something called robotic process automation where there's money, for example. I didn't want to get into that, which is more of using computers to solve the taxation things or reduce the manual work and taxation or other fields. Replacing humans with uh, a repeatable process with uh, RPA software. Or basically the loan migration thing or the franchising thing. I wanted something that I can really feel and, you know, uh, maybe some kind of manufacturing thing, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But everything is going online, that's a different thing. But at the end of it, maybe my inner voice tell me, uh, tells me that if I have to make decisions, if I have to be in a, a leadership role as an entrepreneur or a businessman, then I need to physically see things and touch them or yeah. maybe I'm not. Maybe you're not what? Maybe, you know, digital... Maybe at some point of time, things will become digital. But what I'm saying is, I want to start off with things that I can see, feel, and touch. Yeah, Something yeah. me that. No, exactly. That's a good thing. Um, like right now, I talk a lot about like trying to automate things to make life easy. Definitely, but that's because I have a lot of the build experience already, and I think that's a natural progression. If you if you start, you you definitely want to get the first hand experience to understand how it's made before you go on to the automation part. Because without understanding like the real how it's made, you're not going to be good at the automation part you, you, and cause problems instead of <laughs> making solutions. Yeah, yeah. Because I I definitely believe like um, like for example like for the house, um, it's hard physical work even if you're on a skid steer tractor kind of a thing leveling the ground. So I when I was doing that this time I was like okay. Let me have a remote control tractor that I can do it so my body doesn't get abused because you can you know you can do some rough riding in a in the tractor. But that's but that's excellent physical uh, exercise. I mean, I mean the way you see it is people sleep better in the night. 
Yeah, it's I'm true. Not, uh, but if you too, you do, you don't want to do it too long. There's a balance. But if you, <laughs> if, you if you do it, you actually get okay. sick. You know, like if you, for example, do the bobcat riding too aggressively, you s start feeling nause nausea. You know, like you want to throw up. It's uh, it's hard on a body if you do it like for a long time or aggressively. You know, mm -hmm. so there's definitely a space where you want to use tools to assist you not not to replace you so it's a it's a it's a collaboration like a lot of people are scared by technology saying that oh we're gonna get completely replaced but it's not about that it's about how we collaborate with technology to make life better for everybody yeah the other reason why i want to move from software entrepreneurship is for example I assume there are three different teams and three different companies building competing products and one smart guy in one team actually comes up with an algorithm that makes his application much, much faster or his product much, much faster. All the effort that has been put by the remaining two teams and the two other competing companies giving similar products will go for a pass. You know, in computers, suddenly one small discovery can change the whole game. Here physically, you can see incrementally step by step somebody building something. But in software, you go to Play Store, for example, you go to App Store, for example. You have millions of applications and it is something like people don't seem to understand the power of uh, a Google or of mobile devices. I'm not referring to educated people, but most people who use them, the kind of uh, business disruption that internet or the mobile phone or Google has brought. For example, Google will put anybody on the, you know, to something like McDonald's, where I go, they have it on the main road of the corner shop. Google, you pay the money, they'll make you the first uh, search result on their website. The ability, and uh, sometimes the way I put it, I mean, basically, if one company comes up with one, one algorithm, they can destroy competition overnight. The ability to see the future of a business in a tech driven business is very hard, say, five years down the line. Warren Buffett's kind of thinking, he didn't in initially invest in software or in technology companies. He said, We want businesses that are predictable, we want to see where there is stability. We don't want something that gives us millions overnight, but something that can predictably build over time. It's a different thing that now here in Charlie Bunga, for example, at Berkshire Hathaway, they say that uh, they, uh, they regret not investing in Google or Apple. But having said that, they want to see predictability in a business. Now, but the future belongs to disruption because a lot of these things are coming. But what I'm saying is, if people, many people I see in India, for example, they want to do a startup. They want to build a unicorn. Now, their main, the subconscious or the idea at the back of their mind is build some product, create an MVP, a minimal viable product, and go to a VC or an investor for angel or for fintech, build up a valuation. They don't see value on a daily basis. They can't see the future five years down the line. If somebody else comes up with a better algorithm, the product is gone. Mm -hmm. the, when there is physical, for example, one of the best businesses, actually speaking, for example, if you've been in real estate for 50 years, 60 years, you own a piece of land on a, in a commercial street. You, today, you'll have one kind of business. 10 years later, you'll have another kind of business. No matter who comes into business or who goes out of business, you'll always remain in business because you're getting the For example, today mobile phone is selling, smartphones are selling. Prior to that, the old style Nokia stone kind of mobile phones are selling. Prior to that, cameras were Who sees cameras nowadays, for example? There are no cameras. There are going to be no photocopy machines in the future, I guess. We don't have this uh, automated teller machines or what is, cash machines. When money becomes digital, you won't have cash machines. So people are going to rent their premises for cash machines to banks. They won't exist. But what I'm essentially saying is predictability is most in real estate compared to businesses because old businesses are no longer there. But when it comes to IT, you can't even predict for years down the line whether you may build up a million dollar valuation today in an IT company. One year down the line, nobody knows whether in business because a better product can come up because somebody can come to the better algorithm. Overnight, competition can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So uh, online businesses work with a very different business model. For example, if you have money, I cannot compete with keep your Amazon because there is this book by uh, Pat Dorsey. He he's written a book, Five Rules to Successful Stock Market Investing. He says, if I hire somebody and I give him a problem, how to build a network like eBay of buyers and sellers or Amazon, ideally I wouldn't do it because it's not possible. They have built a circle where a buyer attracts a seller, a seller attracts a buyer, and over time they've built a massive network. And it is impossible to be that kind of a network. So IT works by very different rules, which in my opinion, I don't understand. And most people in my friend circle don't understand. But they're out there to build something which they have dreams of building a unicorn, a billion dollar valuation. 
95 percent of the startups fail for that reason, mm-hmm. and partly because they give the market what they don't need. There are too many competing products. If I go to Play Store, for example, or even the app you're using, uh, Jitsi, for example, if I, I don't even know which tool is better because when I put something, there are 10 competing apps. This could be excellent, partly because it's open source, everybody can use it. But what I'm saying is, me as a person who has got 10 minutes to decide among 10 competing products, which tool to use for video conferencing, I'll pick up the first one that comes. You look at your airline tickets, for example, when you type of the uh, uh, airline tickets between Los Angeles and Bangalore, for example. People usually go by the first page of search listing. Nobody goes to the second page of Google. 80-90% of search results happen only are taken on the first page. Yeah. Google, you go to third or fourth page, you get only irrelevant results. Nobody has tried. Maybe they don't have the understanding or the depth of thinking as hard to go to the next page. So tech is something that is a bit scary or maybe if I don't understand tech too much, do I come from that line? Because businesses can be disrupted any time, is the way I see it. One day comes up with a very good algorithm, other companies can vanish from it. Yeah. So, yeah. Partly. So what else? What else do we want to talk about? So, so the thing is, uh, so let's go forward on the three D printer, and so I can send you some info. But um, so we'll start by I'll send you an agreement, and we can basically focus around the three D printer for now, and let's start talking about like what are the specific you know, say one year down the road, you know, if you think about it, what would, can you think of anything that would be the ideal situation right now? Like, what, where would you like to be down the road as a result of, of the mentorship? Uh, one year down the line, say, suppose one year down the line, the way I would say it is starting from today. If, for example, I start with a 3D printer, work, build something, parallelly start an enterprise and sell it, and actually start building new things that are there on the OSC roadmap and sell it parallel. So it becomes like contribute to open source, learn from open source, and actually sell something so that actually feeds the development of other things. Mm-hmm. The way you put it initially. Initially, you want, you had to make a decision between you know selling one thing, but then there was the joy of seeing the integration of many other things, he said. Mm-hmm. So basically, mm-hmm. those were of the two paths you have to take. And uh, you went on building things rather than you know, trying to create a business. So something similar, learn from you and actually the lessons that you have seen over your experience of 2012, for example. Mm-hmm. Build something, mm-hmm. sell it, let the money come in, build something else and create a line of products to sell and uh, go with the OSC roadmap. Yeah, that would be awesome. So how much runway do you have in terms of like, uh, if you you don't have to work right now, because uh, you, you worked for, for some time in your history, how much runway do you have? like? What's your timeline for when you have to start making sales and then revenue starts coming in because you got to live? Six months to one year. I'm happy with that. Mm-hmm. Six months to one year. Yeah, should be doable. So, I've been managing my investments in the stock market, so uh, I'm fairly okay. But uh, uh, essentially, you know, you got a lot of confidence when you're able to sell something that gives you the extra energy to build more, you know. Your back of mind, you know, that what you build sells, for example. Yeah. That gives you a lot of confidence. Mm-hmm. And at some point of time, uh, once I know how things are built, hire people and actually make the initiative bigger here. Not just do it myself, but hire more mechanical engineers, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, build uh, the OSC faster here. You know, if one person takes X time, if five people are there, it yeah. takes X by five, you know. So. That's that's what we want. Um, I think that's, that's pretty good. Um, Labor is very cheap in India, and once you train them to do something, right? So basically, once I learn something, once I train them, it is very easy to expand the initiative. What do you think is uh, how many different three D printer manufacturers are there in India? What's your competition right now? Uh, I met a guy here who runs a place called Maker Global, and uh, there's a hub. For example, it's called. Uh, uh, there are quite a few hubs wherein uh, websites wherein you can order parts. Mm-hmm. And uh, somebody 3D prints it for you. It's like a buyer and a seller, a thing like eBay, like for uh, consumers and buyers of 3D parts. Yeah. It's a uh, 3D hubs is one of the examples. But uh, 3D printer, I'll have to check out the market. There's a WhatsApp group for it. I'll I've got a friend who runs a company called Makers Global. I'll ask me. I'll ask him to add me to that. Oh, so you don't know if there's uh, there's got to be some producers. Let's Google real quick. Uh, 3D printer 
But what I know is big companies, they are investing big time on 3D printers, especially the ones, because I know there are two categories, one that makes it plastic, one with metal, I think. The metal one seems to be... Metal forged? Mark forged? Yeah, I think. I don't know much about but that's, printers, so but it's not really so like multinational. I'm wondering if there's any um, uh, lo ones that can, started locally, because that's one uh, the first can, thing to look at. I, I can I can actually after the email after the call I can get back to you if you give me a couple of days. I'll check with yeah. this guy. I'll get to the complete market the overview of what happens here. Yeah, let's get a view of the market and see where we go. Create some business assets, start selling them, and, <laughs> and uh, okay. By the way, like just just to let you know, there is no open source high temperature three D printer right now. That's a that's a big thing that we want to develop, because right now people are just printing tiny things. Typically, you can't print well with common plastics like polyethylene or polypropylene. Like most plastics require high temperature chambers, and that's why you only print like with ABS and PLA and TPU and stuff like that. Um, so by doing the high temperature 3D printer chamber, you enable basically the whole trash waste stream so you can start printing large things because then you're you're turning trash into filament, which means inexpensive and not like $20 a kilo for the filament. Because that you can't make anything with that if it's $20 a kilo. So I saw this on one of the your videos. Yeah. The same thing, I think you were talking to somebody else, maybe in Malaysia, I don't know. So that yeah. is like, I saw the same point you mentioned, you mentioned there. Exactly. So that's for safe filament. So, so right here is a chance to, okay, you develop 3D printing, but on the other hand, you can be solving the plastic waste issue, and that's that's where the innovation comes in, because nobody solved it yet, you know? So we gotta we got to work together. So. Definitely. So, so let, for our next step, let's let me send you an agreement for some of the things we talked about, and we can start working on, on uh, I mean, I, if you can, uh, start looking into a business plan for what kind of uh, enterprise, what the enterprise would look like. I can feed you some info from, uh, so actually the other guy, Ken, from from Indonesia, he wrote yeah. up a, an initial business plan too, and we, and we, can, we can all share those assets, assets so we can, can keep developing and, and evolving it to see what makes sense and develop it for all the countries. Because what I want to see is, like right, right now I think about OSC, it's like there will be chapters in each country, like in the United States, I want to have a chapter in each, each, each of the states, so that we're all collaborating as a distributed effort. Um, There's one in Germany as well, right? I uh, they're, they're, they're pretty much independent. They're, they're not, uh, I mean, no, no one is really doing it as far as I know for like a full-time job. They're, they're, they're all just like part-time stuff. So, so they're, they're, they're not highly really coordinated. They're doing kind of like a lot of their own projects. Here, if we're talking about the next phase, it's like, okay, let's talk about what a common licensing scheme would be for certification. So we have uniform products, uniform product qualities and labeling. So the whole... Uh, package where the, the quality, quality control is kept uh, to to, to a re reliable, replicable product that is uh, contributed by all the people. So we haven't we haven't really I mean we haven't done like this national international thing. We're we're just doing this out of uh, some machines from from the United States location here, but we we still got a lot of work to do in in terms of developing this whole thing all over the world. So let me send you a, an agreement. We can start working on a business plan so you can see like what kind of numbers are feasible and amount of time it takes and how much time you want to put into that and what kind of goals you want to set. So let's communicate on that and, and let's start, man. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Do you go by Ash or Ashwin or? Anything, Ash is fine, Ashwin is fine too, sorry. Ashwin. Ash. You prefer Ash or Ashwin? Yep. Up to you. Okay, Ashwin. Up to you. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So excellent. So let's let's get rolling. And and yeah, I mean, um, as an early adopter, I think like the the quicker we all succeed, then the quicker it could actually start growing like it's supposed to. Because we're not there yet. That's that's w that's why we're here to make that happen. So let's do it. But uh, you need to give me time to scale up because the three D printer thing is entirely new for me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I'm I'm expecting. You learning curve so you know you gotta be realistic about the expectations how would you rate yourself for how you said you said you mentioned that that you're learning like how would you rate your learning ability do you think you're a fast learner like or a slow learner or if it is about reading box i'll put it one out of ten or two out of ten if the same background 
3, 4 out of 10 videos may be zero. But if it is doing things, 6 or 7 out of 10. If it is taking or physically things, 6 or 7 out of 10. It is not that I can't read or, you know, I'm educated, I'm qualified, I'm a bit in computer science, I spent one and a half decades in software. Not that I can't do that, but my the way I have transformed maybe in the last one, two years is anything that is physical, I can you know, spend eight hours or ten hours easily without break to that. And maybe your contributions. So, so you're when you said, for example, yeah, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. When you said, for example, copywriting, if anything has to do with the computer, the keyboard, and writing, no. If it is videos, maybe all day. If it is building things, maybe all day. Very fast and doing that. No problem. Mm -hmm. If you want and to. My question is like, how how do we try to teach people in a more effective way? So what would you say the answer is? So you pe you pointed to the the O'Reilly books with their particular format, but how do you think we can actually train people in a more rapid way? Uh, two things here. There was this, uh, two things. The first point is, Engino had this toy CAD or kid CAD software, which I sent you on a different video. Part by part, they'll show you how to build something. I don't know whether that can be used to teach them to build things. That I don't know. I'll send you that the email again. Wherein they've got a software, suppose you're a parent and you've got the Lego toy at home, and you're with your kid, and uh, Let's say it's 500 pieces where you don't want to get your hands up. You just give it to your child and you go to a different room. You don't want to get into building it. Plus, you don't know how to build it. These people give you a software and they show step by step. The video does one step, you do one step. You press the next button, does one step, it does one step, you do one step. So it lets you build along with your child. That is one way of doing it. So I don't know whether that can be applied to actually helping people build things. Many times they can build things without, for example, you, you may teach me to build a tractor without knowing what an engine is inside. Ashwin put this part, Ashwin put that part, put this, put that. And as you talk, I keep building. Even that is good. Yeah. I'll send you that email again. So there is a software called KidCAD by a company, a toy company called Engino. I'll okay. send you that email again. Okay. Um, but tell me, like, do you think that's something, would you enjoy creating that that instructional material or that would be something not, not as much? Can you create that or? I really prefer to build things and maybe talk as I build, and I can hire somebody to polish up that material. Yeah, yeah, maybe we and can. Somebody to polish up that material. Yeah. But I really would like to build and talk as I build. Maybe the polishing part, wherein getting every single font right or getting every single video editing right. Maybe I would like to start up with building things. The the way I see it is, I don't uh, see myself as a teacher to teach others, but maybe as a teacher just to learn. You know, because as I talk, you know, uh, I see as a teacher to learn. Even when I post videos on uh, Facebook or YouTube, right, it is not so much as to create learning material for this. It is more about to teach to learn. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So teaching is a part of uh, learning for me to build something. That yeah. is the way I put it. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, Ashwin. And so uh, the second answer. Sorry. Go ahead. The second answer is there is this book, The Accounting Game. A basic accounting, basic accounting fresh from the limited stand. Yeah. Written by two authors, Daryl Mullis. In the first page, they actually tell you how people learn. The, I'll send you the preface page, wherein they actually list how people learn. So, that's around by asking questions. If you have motivation, for example, when I was in uh, high school, I had been to my aunt's place. We had this treasure hunt, which we played in the middle of the night. It was, uh, it, we were living in flats. So, it was something like, there's a treasure hunt somewhere outside every house, there's a, on the pot, on the uh, plant pot, there's a hint place. So you're constantly in search of a treasure, you open up a hint and then some clue is written on it. Based on that, you go to some other house. So it's about asking questions, thinking, just because you're in search of something and that's how you learn when you find that treasure. So it's about asking questions. Mm -hmm. And only when you ask questions, people learn. Yeah. And when they think, and they need a motivation to ask a question, that's to be a reward. Yeah. Because we want to learn, well, we want to create learning or teaching materials for all kinds of different learning styles to make it easier for everybody. So we'll explore that. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds good. So, so I think we, we can wrap it up here. So good to meet you, and uh, we will continue on the internet. I'll That's send right. you agreement. Okay. Take care then. So thank you. Very nice to see you, Have a nice day. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.